Hi everyone, so as you probably know if you're watching this, I've decided to start doing a series of regular videos. Um, it's going to be a mix of vlogs, recordings of panels, that kind of thing. So for this first one, I've decided we're going to start off with a vlog series on The Legend of Korra Season 4. It's on right now, I haven't started watching it yet, so I figured, hey, that's a great place to start. So, this is my immediate, just watched it, haven't seen anything else. Don't have any spoilers beyond what was in the season trailer. This is my review of The Legend of Korra, Season 4, Episode 1, After All These Years. So that was a pretty good start. It wasn't quite up to the sheer WTF-ery of Season 3's premiere with random airbenders showing up everywhere, but it still had some pretty solid stuff. Um... I'm a little unhappy with the fact that Kuvira is pretty much being depicted as a villain just right off the bat. I mean, right from her first scene, she's standing with her hands clasped behind her back, looking at a giant map of the world, marking off the territories she now controls. I think she might be evil, maybe, just a little bit evil. Um... And I think we're she's going to be yet another instance of a misguided villain, you know? This isn't like Ozai and his hammy, scenery-chewing, I am the Dark Lord type of villainy. This is, like most of Korra's villains have been, people who are misguided. People who are working towards things that are arguably actually good, like equality and unity and freedom and now peace and order, but they're doing it in evil ways, which, you know, is how most evil in real life actually happens. Um, it's interesting to me, so far Kuvira seems to be behaving in standard issue Imperialism 101 methods. Uh, find people who are in need, Offer them help with lots of strings attached. That's pretty much how imperialism works, folks. That's how you get empires. That's how Rome expanded. That's how Britain expanded. That's how the U.S. expands. You give people help, and you attach lots of little strings. We see that in action with uh, the... They keep saying the Yai province. The close captions look like they should be pronounced Yi, but... The Avatar series have never been very consistent about pronunciation, so whatever. Um, the Yai province, uh, which is where we get two of our main characters for this episode, actually, which is interesting, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, Kai and Opal, who are both, you know, second-tier characters in Season 3, are basically... The characters we spend the most time with this episode, they're the ones who have the conflict, the adventure. Um, they get to go out and try to fight the bandits and lose, and then the town has no choice but, or state, I guess, has no choice but to accept Kuvira as their new de facto ruler. Um... I do like that the Earth Kingdom has just dissolved into all of these little states, because if you remember back to Avatar, you had the ki the Earth King in ba in uh, Ba Sing Se, but you also had Bumi as a king um, in Omashu, and I mean the implication I always got was that the Earth Kingdom had fragmented when it was invaded. When they talk later about how it's very diverse, you know, it's probably got a lot of little nations within it. I mean, we, we saw, from early on, we saw at least a couple of distinct ethnicities within the Earth Kingdom. The Sandbenders, for example. Uh, so it makes sense that it would dissolve into a bunch of smaller nation-states once that powerful central authority, that empire, was removed. And of course, what happens in the ruins of an empire? People try to build new empires. In this case, it looks like the main conflict is going to be between Kuvira, who has actual skills, and Wu, who has kind of the hereditary claim to the throne. 
History tells us which of those is probably going to win. The answer is both. Wu takes the throne, and Kavira actually runs things from behind it. But we'll see what happens. Um, I really don't like Wu. I mean, I know we're not supposed to like Wu, but on top of that, I don't like the way he's being depicted. Him being a self-centered, narcissistic, arrogant jerk? Great. Perfect. Go with that. What I don't like is the emphasis throughout the episode on him enjoying quote-unquote girly activities like going to the spa. Um, I hope they drop that thread. I hope it's just this episode because I don't like this equation of narcissism to luxuries and, you know, caring about one's appearance and going to great effort to take care of one's appearance. I mean, I personally, I mean, look at me. I'm not someone who really goes to a lot of effort on my appearance. I'm not going to go spend four hours at a spa. I'd rather spend that time working on something. But it's not for me to say that that's necessarily wrong for other people. Certain people, because of what's in their lives, need to do that. If your appearance is part of your profession, if you're an actor, a politician, a prince trying to gain back control of his country, looking good can matter a lot. It becomes a worthwhile time investment. Plus, it clearly, it's something he enjoys. You know, I really wish they'd done a better job of separating that from him being a narcissistic jerk. But we'll see. We'll see what happens with him. Hopefully he'll be a very minor character. Someone else who I hope is remains a very minor character, even though he's probably after Kai and um, Opal, the most prominent character in the episode, is Mako. Because, and I've made this clear in comments on Tumblr about the series, I do not like Mako. Mako is a jerk. Mako lies to people, Mako manipulates people, and his preferred targets are people he is supposedly in close relationships with, like whoever his girlfriend is at the moment, his brother, etc. Um, so I would prefer he stay toward the back, especially if he's going to continue having that horrible haircut at me constantly every time I look at him. That thing is offensive. It should not be permitted. Um, I kid, of course. So that's kind of the main characters of this episode, which is really interesting. Korra does not appear until the last minute or two, so we spend the whole episode wondering where is Korra? This is her show. Building anticipation for her appearance, especially because the last time we saw her, she was in really bad shape. You know, beaten, wheelchair-bound, miserable. Now we see her, and, you know, she's clearly been doing the incognito martial artist thing of becoming a prize fighter um, in some kind of an underground circuit. Um, I like to imagine that that's uh, the evolution of Earth Rumble. If you all remember back when Toph was introduced, it would be really fitting considering that the uh, trailers seem to strongly suggest that Toph is coming back this season. So it'd be we get our avatar introduced at Earth Rumble. But regardless if it's actually Earth Rumble or just some kind of prize fighting that involves Earth Bending, it's a nice sequence, good fighting. Um, Korra gets beat pretty bad, which is um, it's an indicator of she's still got a ways to go of recovering her abilities. And, you know, I am and I'm not okay with that. On the one hand, yeah, I, I like the idea of there being consequences. I like the idea that she won, but at a price last, last season. And she's still paying that price. She's still healing. Because, you know what? People who fight for a living take damage. They get hurt. Especially when it's, you know, actual trying to kill each other combat and not a sport. People are going to get hurt very badly doing that. Sometimes even when they win. And that takes its toll on you. Um, on the other hand... Well, it goes back to the original concept of women in refrigerators, which mostly gets talked about in terms of female characters getting killed. But um, it's also the case, and right back in the original women in refrigerators uh, article that was put online, 
uh, by Gail Simone, I believe, the whole concept is not just about women getting killed. It's also about female superheroes. You know, female superheroes are female comic book characters getting killed, but it's also about them getting depowered because that is also something that happens to them a lot more often than male characters. And yes, in the first series, Aang lost the ability to tap the Avatar state, but he had only ever tried to use it in a positive way once. Every other time it was something that happened to him, not something that he did. So it's a little debatable whether that really counts as him being depowered or just having an extra obstacle in the way of acquiring powers. With Korra, the first season ends with all her bending except her air bending getting taken away. Yeah, it gets restored five minutes later, but it still happens. The second season ends with her losing access to her past lives. All of her, you know, ghostly advisors are gone. Third season ends with her in a freaking wheelchair. Every single season, she has ended with her being depowered. It's upsetting to me. It's frustrating because it really feels like that's the only story people could think of to tell with their female character. Is it a coincidence? It could be. But three times in a row is hard to call a coincidence. So... I'm really hoping that this season does not end, especially because it's the last season, I'm really hoping it doesn't end with her being depowered, and I'm really, really hoping it does not end, as I've seen some people online suggest that they think it might, with her dying. I don't think either of those will happen. I actually think the opposite. I think the end of this season will establish her as the first of the new avatars. Alternatively, it may involve her finding a way to relink with her past lives. Either way, I don't think it's going to end with depowering or death, but I'm worried that it might. I would really prefer it not. Um, what else is there to talk about on this one? Bolin. I'm really liking, I really liked what they did with Bolin last season. I'm really liking what they're doing so far with him this season. It really looks like he's going to be stuck in the moral dilemma between the people trying to do good through bad methods and the people who don't really have a solution. You know, given a choice between Kovira and Prince Wu, it's a tough call. I mean, ultimately, yeah, you go with Prince Wu because he may be a jerk, but at least he's not trying to conquer the universe. But, you know, I can see where it would be difficult, especially because from Boleyn's perspective, he only sees... Excuse me. He only sees passing out food and fighting bandits. He doesn't see the conversations where Kuvira tells local leaders that they now work for her. He doesn't see the strings. He doesn't see the stick. He just sees the carrot. So I could definitely see him feeling like this is a good thing to be doing. And there's going to be a dilemma coming there. And so I like that. I like that they are finding things to do with Bolin that aren't, like in the first couple of seasons, him being a crappier version of Sokka. Um... So this is good. This is good. Um, like I said, I really like that they held out on showing Korra to us, because of course that's what we were curious about, so give us some time to stew, give us other things to look at. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things I wanted to talk Oh, oh, Asami. Asami and Mako. I am incredibly glad that Asami, of the way Asami and Mako interact early in the episode. Asami behaves like a mature adult. Mako behaves like a mature adult. They interact like two people who dated when they were kids, and now they're friends. And I really like that, and I really hope that means that they are not going to date each other, because frankly, Mako should not be allowed to date. Unless he can demonstrate that he's grown up a hell of a lot, which so far... He has not, because he has no personality, so how would he demonstrate it? Um, it really looks, and I'm really hoping for, that this season is going to have some political maneuvering going on. It looks like, you know, Raiko is backing Wu, wants to see Wu take over the Earth Kingdom. Meanwhile, it seems like uh, Kuvira is making a bid to take over the Earth Kingdom. I am guessing 
that um, the Beifongs are not wanting to rejoin the Earth Kingdom. They want to stay in their independent little city, which is probably why they, you know, are so not happy. So we've got brother divided against brother, sister divided against sister. This is going to be interesting. And into the midst of all of that, we've got whatever's going on with Coral, whatever walkabout or vision quest or whatever you want to call it she's on, you know, she's got to refine herself and rebuild who she is because the airbenders are out trying to restore balance to the world and they're clearly spread too thin. There's a need for the Avatar here, and I like that that's not outright stated, but very clearly depicted. Uh, this really feels like a show, finally, you know, it struggled its first couple of seasons, but this is really starting to feel like a show that knows what it is and what it's doing and where it wants to go. Um, so here's hoping. Here's hoping that now that they're a little older, the characters are a little less obnoxious. Season 3 mostly did a good job of that, so hopefully they'll keep with that. Uh, hopefully they'll keep moving the characters forward instead of that weird let's erase all character development and start over from the beginning they did in Season 2. Um, hopefully we won't get any more depowerings. Hopefully we won't see, you know, if any characters do die, it will be in ways that make it about them and make it powerful instead of Oh, let's kill someone off. Um, you know? But, just generally, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. The big thing I'm hoping for is that it does not do what Season 3 did. Season 3 had some really good stuff, but it shied away from one big thing. It shied away from admitting that while their methods might be a little suspect, that's debatable, the Red Lotus was right. And I really hope we get into that, because I have a suspicion. We'll see how it plays out, but I suspect that either Toph founded the Red Lotus, or was involved in its founding in some way, because I have never been able to believe that Toph the Rebel became, you know, the man. That she became a cop. But her doing that job in order to spy on Republic City, in order to get inside information so that her anarchist buddies could help bring down the man, that I can see. Those anarchist buddies then getting out of control and violent, I can also see. Toph le I can see Toph leaving because of that, because she regrets doing that. I can see her leaving because she can't stand what the world around her is becoming. And I can see her leaving to lead the Red Lotus. Any of those are possible. I really, and even if that's not the case, I still really see Toph as a proponent of chaos. And that's going to be important when we've got Kuvira representing order. I'm looking forward to Metalbender versus Metalbender fighting somewhere down the line. Well, that's my thoughts about the episode. Um, next week, I'll take a look at episode two. Hope you enjoyed it.